For your mercy never fails me And all my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of Cause all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the good so very much. I appreciate that. Take your Bibles and go with me tonight, if you would, back to the book of Luke, chapter number 15. I appreciate what the Lord did in the services this morning uh, as I was <clears throat> looking over the message for the, for the week and or for, for this Sunday. And I really felt like that, that God was going to have me in this text all day uh, from this morning, this evening. I know it's a familiar passage of Scripture. For those that wasn't here this morning, we, de we did deal with the prodigal. We talked about a rise and go. Uh, when the prodigal made the decision, he said, I will arise and go to my father. And I'm grateful that as, as individuals, as people who fail and people who fall short and sometimes we go our own path and go our own way, I'm grateful that there is a Heavenly Father that we can return to. I'm grateful that the, the, His door is never closed, that, that, that Heaven is never shut up for the people of God. And I'm so very thankful for that. So we talked a little bit about the prodigal this morning as far as arising and going. And, and uh, we, uh, we mentioned those verses there and, and uh, we'll just do a quick review uh, here in just a moment, but we're going to look at a little bit different aspect tonight uh, to where the responsibility is not so much on the prodigal, but on those who are there to receive the prodigal as he comes home. And so I want you to stand with us tonight, if you would. We're going to read uh, about four verses this evening, and then we'll make our prayer. It's been good to be in the Lord's house tonight. I appreciate uh, what God has done and allowed us to be here. And I'll, I'll say this, I'm thankful for our church. I'm thankful for our church family. It's amazing to me how that God can take a bunch of imperfect people, put us under the same roof, and allow us to worship Him, allow us to serve Him. And the Lord is just so very good to us. And I'm so, I'm so very grateful for what God has done. But I'm grateful for, for this group of people. I mean that. And uh, so thank you so very much for being here, being a part of that. Uh, let's begin reading down tonight, uh, if you would. That's, that's, that's my message from this morning. We don't want to start over. Go down to verse number 20, and we'll begin reading there. You know, this morning I was over in John... 
And uh, I was trying to preach out the prodigal son out of John 15. That didn't work. Turn back over to Luke 11. That didn't work either, but I finally got landed. So we're in Luke 15, down to verse number 20. The Bible said, He arose and came to his father. But when he was a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be married. Let's bow tonight for a word of prayer. Brother Chuck, take us on prayer if you would. Amen. Thank you, Brother Chuck. You can be seated tonight. And uh, <clears throat> we talked a little bit this morning about arising and going. We talked about the path that led us straight. And, uh, you know, he had some, some preconceived ideas, you know, where it all went wrong. And talked about that sense of entitlement that he had. He, he was living for the flesh. He was living for what he desired and what he wanted, and he wanted it now, and he didn't appreciate even the way that, even what he had in the father, uh, there at the father, with the father, and he didn't uh, really appreciate and understand how, how life really in and of itself worked. Uh, you know, we're not, you know, the life is not in the, the abundance of things that we have. Life is so much more than that. So we talked about that, and uh, we, we said that he made a decision, he chose to leave, and, and we gave, gave those things, and we talked about the, 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 the process, if you would, of, of him coming home, what it meant for him to come back and return back to the Father. And again, I'll say I'm so very glad that we do have a Heavenly Father. If you're saved tonight, you have a Heavenly Father that's there and we can return back to Him. But tonight I want to talk about a little bit different aspect and I want to look at this fact. What do we do when the prodigal returns? What are those of us who at the time we've never left the Father? Those at the time we're not wondering. Maybe we're in our closest that we've ever been to the Father and, and you know we're, we're to that point to where as those outsiders, and we, we watch individuals who, who get away from God and they begin to stray. And, you know, sometimes we have a tendency to say the wrong things. Sometimes we have the tendency to think the wrong thoughts. And, and maybe even in the, in the area of, of trying to help, maybe sometimes we stick our foot in our mouth and maybe we say something. Hurt. But, but what do we do when the prodigal comes home? Now, I'm, I'm an independent Baptist from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. Uh, I, I'm, I'm that way by conviction, not by convenience. And so I want to say this, and I want to say this as honestly as I know how. We can be pretty cruel. We can be hard on people. And I, listen, I'm for right living. I'm for living clean. I'm for living holy. I'm for living a righteous life. Uh, but I'm also understanding, but, what, but, uh, but were it not for the grace of God, we'd be in the same shape. Were it not in the mercy and, and the grace and the, and the long-suffering of our Heavenly Father... Uh, it could very well be us because our flesh is no better than their flesh. Uh, my, my righteousness in and of itself is no better than their righteousness. And so may we be mindful of how we handle when the prodigal comes home. Uh, I will say this before we jump in the message. Uh, I am grateful, I am grateful that God is in the restoration business. I am grateful that God can take a wrecked and a ruined and, and, a, and a train wrecked life and God can salvage that life. God can change that heart. God can bring them back to where they once went astray. I'm thankful that we have a God that's in the restoration business, not the writing off business. And I'm thankful that that's the kind of father that this young man had. Now, if you'd have left it up to those servants, if you'd left it up to that other son, that other brother, it would have been a whole different outcome. But aren't you thankful for a father? Aren't you thankful for a father that sees us the way nobody else sees us? That knows us the way nobody else knows us? I begin to think about this tonight. We're going to look at everything about this when the, prodigal, when the prodigal returns. Everything that we look at tonight is going to center around the wishes and the will of the Father. In other words, let me say it like this. The Father sets the tone for this entire story. The Father does. The Father sets the, the, the tone for how the household is going to respond uh, for, for what takes place when the prodigal comes home, for the, for the treatment of that prodigal when he walks through the door, how the father reacts sets the tone for how everybody else reacts. Let me tell you something. We ought, to, we ought to set the tone on how we respond based on what the father has to say. That's, what, that's where our tone should be set. That's what should establish our thinking and our mindset. And we're going to have to be willing to get ourselves out of the way and really look to see, hey, what does the Father have to say about these things? So, first of all, let's pick up where we left off this morning. I want us to look, first of all, tonight at the Father's response to this thing of restoration. What, what, was, what, what was the Father's response? 
Now listen, I know in a familiar passage, we've got so many, we've got so many ideas. We've heard it and heard it. You know, you can, you can tell it. You can preach it as well as I can. I'm not trying to, to paint any uh, ideas that it's not. It's a familiar passage of Scripture. But I want us to look and really think about what was the Father's response in restoration. I like verse number 20. The Bible said, And he arose and went, talking about the prodigal, to his father. Now again, I made mention, I think this is worth repeating, uh, he did, the Bible doesn't say that he went to the father's house. The Bible said that he went to the father. Uh, it's not just enough to restore the place that you left, but you better restore the relationship of whom you departed from. And so he went back to the father. Now, uh, all, that, all that pertains to the father, we understand he's going to reap the benefit of that, but he wanted to make it right with the father. And so the Bible said that he rose and went to the father. Now, he had this whole, he had this whole speech rehearsed, Remember? I'll go to the Father. This is what I'm going to say. This is what I'm going to tell him. And I, I, I can almost see him going down the road practicing. I can almost see him rehearsing that. You know, okay, yeah, Father, I've sinned. God, Father, I've done right before God and, and before you, uh, to, toward God and to, before, before. No, that's not how I want to say it. That's not. No, let me say it like this. And I can almost see him rehearsing all that. And he had the whole speech. As, and, and, and he's a broken man. Remember, he, he, had, he had to overcome the fear of, well, is he going to reject me? Is he going to push me aside? Is he going to say, listen, uh, you, made your, you made your bed, now you've got to lay in. So he had to overcome all that. But he gets up there and he said, I'll rise and go to the Father. And he takes off and going. And before he could ever open his mouth, before he could say one syllable, the Bible said in verse number 20, but when he was a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed. The boy had said nothing. The boy hadn't said one word. He hadn't, said, he hadn't said, Dad, I'm sorry. He, hadn't, he didn't say, Dad, I'm ashamed. He didn't say, Dad, I've let you. He didn't say nothing. And that father saw his son for who he was. And the Bible said that he ran to him. And he, Now, I want you to think about that picture for just a moment. I want you to think about how that boy must have smelled, how that boy must have looked. Now, listen, I'm not, I'm not here to, to, to preach to try to, to try to tell you something neat and, and we can take light hard. But I want you to really think about, listen, the, the, the example or the, uh, the epitome of life. Man, he, he, it, it permeated all throughout him. Uh, you, you talk about smelling like the world and looking like the world. It was him. Uh, he, he probably hadn't had a, a really hot meal in, in, in a long time. He was fixing to eat with the hogs. You know, he, he hadn't had a good meal in a long time. Uh, it was probably filthy. He's probably dirty. Uh, I, I don't mean it. it any, any of y'all ever smelled a hog farm? They're very distinct. It is a very dis that and, and, and chicken houses. And we got them both around here. Welcome to the South. But th there is a very distinct smell about a hog farm. You ever got a smell on you and you can't get it off? He had it. He had it. Nobody had to wonder, man, where you been? They knew exactly. And the Bible said that his father ran. And he didn't hose him off. Uh, he didn't give him a change of clothes. He wasn't spraying axe body spray all over him. The Bible said that he ran and he fell on his neck. And he kissed him. Sweaty, filthy, dirty, stinky. And the Bible said that that father, who had the best of the best, who had, the, who, had a lap, who had a life of luxury and a life of provision, the Bible said that he threw, he fell on his neck and he kissed that son and he met him where he found him. I'm telling you something, it's a great day to be restored by the... What's the father think about the prodigal coming home? Well, the father's rejoicing. Hey, the father recognized him a great way off. His father, his father saw him. Can I tell you something tonight, child of God? I don't care where you're at. I don't care what you've been involved in. The father recognizes you. You are still a child of God. Hey, I, I believe this. I believe that that boy was probably, he probably looked different than on, the, on his way back than he did on his way out. He probably looked different. There might have been some servants that said, man, who is that guy? Man, who, who in the world is... Man, he's hugging him and, and telling him good to see him. He's crying and he's crying. Who is this guy? But I'm going to tell you something. The, the, he never had to say, Dad, it's me. Can I tell you something, child of God? I don't care how far away you've gotten and you think God doesn't even know me. Listen, you'll never get so far that God has to say, who's that? Or you'll have to say, God, it's me. He knows you just the way you are. He sees you where you're at. He is able to draw you. He is able to, to persuade you if you'll just be willing to listen to the sweet Holy Ghost of God. But the Bible said the Father was rejoicing. He recognized him. I'm glad 2 Timothy 2, 19 tells us this. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them 
that are his. Now he goes on to say this verse, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But God knows you. If you're saved, if you're a child of God, God knows you. God knows you. I'm glad that God never puts us up for adoption. I'm thankful that God never kicks us out of the house. You say, why is that? Because I'm telling you, He knows His children. God knew him. What's God think about the father's rest? Or what's the uh, what's God think about the prodigal returning? Well, the father's response and restoration. There was rejoicing. Hey, the father recognized him. The father had compassion on him. I'm grateful for the compassion of God. You say, preacher, you don't know what I've done. I may not, and I don't need to know. But God already does. God already does. But He tells us if we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know what this boy needed? He needed cleansing. He needed a good cleansing. He needed, he needed to get that stuff off of him. He needed to get that stench off of him. He needed to get that smell off of him. I, I'm not trying to be crude, but he, he might have had something that even soap and water couldn't wash off with the type of lifestyle he was living. But I'm going to tell you something. There's nothing that the Heavenly Father can't cleanse you from. There's nothing that the blood of Christ can't remove and that the blood of Christ can't purify. And I'm grateful tonight that we have a Father that's able to do that. Had compassion on him. He embraced him, but then he restored him. Can you imagine can you imagine the son? I've said this before, but I hope when you read your Bible, you kind of use your imagination a little bit. And I'm not saying add to the scriptures. But I want you to, you ought to, we ought to think about what we're reading. This son, he was, he was resolved to the fact that I will never, ever be a son again. He's already resolved to that fact. He said, I'm just going to go home and I'm just going to ask my father to let me be as one of his hired servants. Just, just let me be a sir. I'm not, I'm not expecting, I'm not expecting much. Can you imagine his surprise when his dad met him halfway out in the road, throwed his arms around him and kissed him? Can you imagine the surprise and the shock of his son to know that my dad hasn't forgotten me? My dad hadn't forsaken me. My dad was looking for me. Can you imagine the surprise that was on his heart? Hey, can I tell you something? It's likely, very highly likely, that this man underestimated the love of his father. And if you're wayward tonight and you've gotten away from God, even if you're right on the outside, but you're wretched on the inside, can I tell you, do not underestimate the love of your heavenly father. I'm not talking about this falsehood, this false sense of love and acceptance as the world, but I'm talking about a righteous heavenly father that loves you in spite of you and will restore you if you'll simply come back to him. Man, he underestimated the love of his dad. But the father's response and restoration, his rejoicing, what about his instructions? Remember when I said everything that they re re reacted to hinged around the will and the, and the, the thinking of the father? Listen to what the father's instructions was. Verse number 22. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe. Now we know the confession is given in verse number 21. I'll say more about that here in just a minute. But repentance is offered in verse number 21. And it's genuine. It's genuine. Now, uh, skip ahead and I might, be getting, I might be getting my notes out of order, but that's okay. Understand this. There's a lot of times that we're skeptical because we don't really believe that the repentance is real. But can I tell you something? That's really not up for me to decide. That's between the repenter and the father. That's between the repenter and the father. But he goes down to verse number 22. And you can almost, you can almost visualize, and, and here's these servants, and they're watching. They know he's been gone. They, they know the lifestyle that he lived. His brother knew about it. So somehow or another, he'd sent a postcard. They'd got a telegram. He'd saw it on Facebook somewhere. But he knew that, hey, this, my brother is living a wicked life. And they knew that. And so he comes back and the father comes in. And, you know, they're kind of sitting on pins and needles, don't you think? Man, what's he going to say? Man, he's he, he, he going to drop the boom. He's going to lower the hammer on him. Just wait. Until he's going to get what's coming to him. I can't wait. I mean, this is, this is going to be good. You're not going to miss it. They're getting their popcorn. And they're waiting for how the father is going to respond. And I think they're all shocked. And he looks up and he says in verse number 22, but the father said to his servants, bring forth, here it is, they're going to bring out the guillotine, he's going to let him have it. He said, I want you to bring forth the best robe. He said, I want you to put it on him. He said, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Now, as far as I can tell, the boy's still filthy. And the boy's still nasty and the boy's still dirty. Listen, he wasn't so much worried about the condition of his coat as he was the condition of his kid. 
He said, I want you to bring forth. And he said, I want you to put the robe on him. And then, by the way, I want you to put the ring on him. Now, listen, this is a really expensive ring. <laughs> Electricians ain't supposed to wear them titanium rings. That's a bad idea. And I got used to wearing it, and I like him. And if, that way, if I lose it, I'm not in trouble because Amazon sells them like, you know, six-pack for $5.99. <laughs> That's not the kind of ring Brother Chuck A. put on him. They brought that father's ring that had that symbol of the household, and they slid that ring on his finger. Now, unless you can't read between the lines, understand what he said. He said, oh, you're not going to be a servant. He said, but you're still a son. And he put that ring on his finger. And, as, and all of those servants watched him. You know what they saw? They saw, hey, listen, the father expects me to treat this young man not like my flesh says to treat him, but like my father says to treat him. Can I tell you something, church? May we be very careful on how we treat those who are often sin, those who are backslidden, but those who genuinely get right with God. May we be gracious. May we be kind. May we be helpful. May we have a desire to help them and to strengthen them and to rebuild them. Why? Listen, life has already tore them down. And if they're back to the Father, listen, let God help them and let's be a part of that healing process. That's what God says about it. Listen, we've got to get past it. We're, we're so mean and vile and wretched toward everybody. Man, we hate everything that moves and if everything don't walk just like we walk and look just like we walk and, or, or look and talk just like we talk, we've written them off. And listen, people fall, people stumble. I'm not excusing sin. I'm not saying that the father said go out and pat him on the back while he was out in the far country. But the father said once he comes back to the house, we're going to treat him like who he is. We're going to treat him right. We're going to love him. We're going to care about him. We're going we're to lift him up to the place that he rightfully deserves to be. And they treated him that way because... Of the Father's wishes. Church, may we never forget that, listen, God is in the restoration business. There's people all around this country, all around our county, that at one time, you know what they did? They lived for God. At one time, they were in the house of God. At one time, they were telling other people about Christ and something somewhere along the line. Listen, maybe by their own decisions, maybe by their own will. It was obviously all their choice. But if God ever brings those people back, may we do our very best to treat them as God desires for them to be treated and understand that restoration is a priority in the heartbeat of God. He gives us Galatians 6.1 for that. We'll look to that in just a moment. He wasn't to be treated with disrespect or disdain. You know, people whisper, people talk. You know, if he'd, if he'd have been, come, man, y'all got quiet all of a sudden. But you know, if he'd have come into a typical Baptist church, They'd have smiled and shook his hand at the door, but they'd have went and talked about him when he left. Let me tell you something. God's not in that. God's not in that. God's in the restitution business. And when God restores somebody, God restores them. God restores them. We want to treat them like a car. You know, you ever, if, you, if you're ever on Marketplace, or something, sometimes people say, oh, yeah, no, it's been fully restored. What that means is, is they took it to Mako. And they put a $150 paint job on it, but the bottom of the, the, the pan's rusted out of it. The motor won't run. They poured motor honey in it before they've listed it so it don't knock and click and bang. They said it's been fully restored. That's not how God restores things. Listen, God takes it back to the very heart of it. And when God makes something new, God makes it brand new. When God makes something whole, He makes it fully whole. Listen, He didn't halfway heal the lepers. When God healed them, God healed them. And I'm telling you, listen, God is in the restoration business and they were not to be treated with disrespect or disdain. He was to be treated and recognized as the Father's Son. May we understand that when God's people get right with God, you know, it, that's how we want it, right? When I get right with God, I want everybody to forgive me. But when somebody else gets right with God, I want them to prove it to me. And I'm telling you, listen, God wanted him to be, or the Father wanted him to be treated as a son. That's real restoration. That's a restored relationship. Then he said, bring hither the robe and the, shoe, the, robe and the ring and the shoes. I like this and we'll move on. You, you understand that these weren't the son's items, but they were the father's items. The son done blew his. He done went through his. That's not good English. But he already went through them. He said, give me what's mine. I, listen, I think he took everything out of his closet. I think he went in there and he got, now he might have got some of them, you know, the clothes that, his grandma bought him, and he said, I ain't wearing that stuff. There might have been some of that in the closet, but, but everything that he liked. I mean, he took, he took, his, he took his best sandals, you know, his Air, his Air Jordan sandals. He took all that stuff. And he got all of that stuff, and he took it with him. And somewhere along the line, he lost everything. You know, the Bible doesn't say that he came back with his suitcases and his luggage. He came back just him. 
He didn't have anything. He had nothing to offer the Father. But man, aren't you glad the Father had everything to offer him? And when he came back, the Father said, go get, go get the best robe. Guess whose closet that was probably hanging in? That's probably hanging in the Father's closet. He said, go get the best robe. Go in there and get, get my favorite one. Get the, get the most expensive one you can find. That's made out of the finest quality material. That's made out of something. Bring it to him. Get, get my ring. Go in there and get one of my signet rings out of my drawer and bring it because I want everybody to know. Aren't you glad the Father wasn't ashamed of him? Aren't you glad the Father didn't say, man, that's, boy, you stink. You've got to do something. Listen, the Father was just glad he was home. The Father was just glad that he was now, his son was back. And the Father knew exactly who he was. And he restored him. He said, go get the ring, the shoes. Listen, our righteousnesses are just like the way Isaiah, they're just filthy rags. But aren't you glad we're clothed with the righteousness of Christ? One that's so great, one that's so much greater, one that's so much purer. We can see an example of restoration here, giving away the responsibility. When you look over Galatians 6 1, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Restore such a one. Listen, if we walk away here with anything, I want us to understand this concept. When God allows people, and when people come back to God, may we, as a local church body of people, may we do our very best to help them in the restoration process, to help them in their walk with Christ, to encourage them, to strengthen them, to edify them, to build them, to welcome them into a place, not while they're living in their sin, not saying, oh, it doesn't matter what you do, just come as you are and stay there. That's not what I'm talking about. And I'm talking about people who genuinely are, are, have their life restored to God through repentance and through a right relationship with God. May we do our very best to rally around those people. Stop tearing them down. Stop being so skeptical that, listen, they, they doubt the people of God and let's help one another as the prodigals return. So what else is that we find? Listen, there's a celebration. We see how the father responded, but what about the celebration? Now, you remember I said this morning, <laughs> and, I, and I, I, I'll probably get talked about, but it's okay, it won't be the first time. I said this morning that you don't party by yourself. You know, he wasted his substance with riotous living. He was talking about the type of individuals that he was uh, running with and that, that, he, that he had associated himself with. Well, let me tell you something. There was a forevermore party that went on at the father's house. There was a celebration. Why? Because his son was back. Uh, it was a big day. It wasn't an ordinary day. Everything stopped. Uh, the, the, the normalcy of the day, the uh, working in the field and the, and the plowing of the, of the garden, all of those things, they ceased. And what did they do? Man, they had a party. They had a celebration. They had a big time. Why? There was something to celebrate. Anytime somebody gets right with God that was, uh, that was uh, headed astray or someone that was going down the wrong path, anytime they come back to God is a reason for celebration. And when, listen, God's people ought to, ought to be rejoicing. We ought to be rejoicing when somebody comes down and weeps and, get right, and gets things right with God. I mean, we ought to be rejoicing. Uh, listen, not just to, to, to have a show, but we ought to rejoice, be rejoicing with them to let them know that, listen, you could have made no greater decision. I'm so happy to have you back in the family of God or back in, with the, in the fellowship with God. There ought to be a celebration, a rejoicing. And God's people get, get, get involved in this. We're so excited about everything else. But how long has it been since we've got excited over people getting right with God? Man, we're easy to talk about them over, over the, the dinner table. We're, e we're easy to, to, to be skeptical and critical. And I'm telling you, it, it's to all of us. But man, we ought to have a desire in our heart that God would restore them. And then when God restores them, to celebrate alongside with them that, listen, they were out there, but now they're back close to the Father. And so the return of the prodigal is not time for skepticism, but a time for celebration. Verse 23, he tells his older son, he said, it was meet that we should make merry. And we're going to talk about the older son here in a minute, and we're going to go to the house. He said, but it was, it was necessary, it was fitting. It was fitting that we had a celebration. I, I can think of, no, the father said, I can think of no better reason to celebrate. Your son was, uh, your, my, my son was dead, now he's alive. Your brother was gone. He was lost and now he's found. The celebration, I like this, was provided by the father. What's he say? He said, I want you to go get the robe and go get the ring, go get the shoes. But then he said, bring hither the fatted calf. You know whose calf it was? It was the father's. You know who paid for it? You know who supplied everything for the meal, everything for the feast, everything for the celebration? All of it was because of the, the provisions of the Father. Can I tell you something? God has provided everything that we have to celebrate. The only reason people come back and get right with God is because of the grace and the provisions of the Father. The only reason that God, that we have an opportunity to make restoration is because of the provision of the Father through His precious Son. The only thing that we celebrate is because of the Father's provisions. 
It was nothing that the, son, that the son had to offer. It was nothing that servants could offer. It was all because of the provision of the father. But I do like this fact that the servants had some responsibility too. The celebration was prepared by the servants. God, the, the father gave them a part in the celebration. Let me tell you something, church. God has allowed us the privilege to have part in the celebration. Now, you may not, you may not get this. and You may say, well, preacher, that's kind of goofy. That's kind of silly. But you know what he said? He said, listen, I've got, a, I've got a fatted calf that we've been saving for a special occasion. He said, I want you to go get the calf and you to kill it, you to prepare it, and you to serve it. He said, you got a part in this celebration. Listen, aren't you glad that God allows us to be a part of that? Aren't you glad that God gives us some responsibility in this thing of restoration? I wrote this down, and uh, I'm going to read it so I don't mess it up. We would do well to kill the calf and, and salvage the kid. Too often times what we want to do is we want to kill the kid so we can save the calf. You say, wow, well, the, the calves, we're saving the calf for, for a special occasion. It's reverent and holy. We don't, want to, we don't want to defile that which is reverent and holy, and so we'd just rather sacrifice the kid. We're missing the whole point of it. We're missing the whole point of it. We do well. Man, if we just said, listen, we'll just go ahead and, and, and yeah, we'll kill the calf. Absolutely. Why? Because the kid's worth it. This young man's worth His life is salvageable. And we're grateful that he's back to the Father. The celebration was partaken of by all. This, this celebration was intended for everybody in the household. Nobody was left out. You'll know that to the fact that even, even when the elder brother got back serving, he said, man, what's going on? He said, come on, there's a party, that, there's, a, there's a big celebration going on. Your brother's back, come on. It was for the father, it was for the prodigal, it was for all the other sons, it was even for the servants. Everybody in the household had a part in this celebration. And that's the way it ought to be when the prodigal returns. There ought to be something within our heart. Right, let me give you something else and I'm done. By the way, all throughout this other, the rest of the chapter, this lost and found chapter, Verse number 6 and verse number 9. You know what the Bible says when they found that which was lost? The Bible said they called up their friends to rejoice with me. Can I tell you something? There's never been a greater reason, reason to rejoice than when a sinner repents and when a saint comes back and gets right with God. Man, that's the reason. We, we rejoice about all kinds of things, money and provisions and all of that. But at the bottom line, when people get right with God, there's no greater event to celebrate. He said, go get your friends. Tell them all. Get them all to come. Let's celebrate together. So, how do we respond when the prodigal comes back? Well, first of all, we need to understand and recognize the Father's response and restoration because that sets the tone for everything. Second of all, we need to understand there's a celebration. We can have part in it. But third of all, I would leave you with this challenge. Don't be the older brother. You say, preacher, none of that's alliterated. It'll be, it'll be okay. Don't be the older brother because the older brother is really the easiest mold to fit into. Man, it's easy. It's easy to be the older brother. Now, I'm going to show you two or three things, but don't, don't be the older brother. When you're the older brother, you miss out on God's best even for your life. Let me show you this. If we're not careful, we can fall into this self-righteous demeanor. Again, after all, here's what we think. Man, I'm faithful. I'm living my best life. I'm close to the Father. I see the Father every day. I talk to Him every day. I say goodbye. I say good night. I say good morning. We have lunch together. I mean, I'm close to the Father. Who does He think He is? If we're not careful, we can adopt this self-righteous demeanor. You say, well, what, what, is, what does it tell us about the son? Well, first of all, he was angry. He was angry. Look at verse number 28. And he was angry and would not go in. He was angry. He was mad that they were celebrating his brother was home. He, he was upset. Now, I can't fathom, I can't understand why people get upset when people get right with God. It happens. It happens. Somewhere down on the line, he wanted, he wanted his brother to get what was coming to him. Now, I, I'm, an, I'm an only child, okay, so I can't enter into some of this. But I do have three kids that at one time when they were home, I'm sure that they looked when one got in trouble and they wanted the other one to get what was coming to them too. I'm sure of it. I'm positive. I, I, I'm, I'm positive of it. I'm sure that they look, and I know that I, Caleb was especially happy when Corey got in trouble. <laughs> Caleb rejoiced in the Lord greatly when Corey got in trouble. He wanted Corey to get what was his. Cassie was probably rejoicing when Caleb got what was coming to her. They were both rejoicing when Cassie got what was coming to her. But I mean, that's just how brothers are, right? 
But I'm going to tell you something. They become so, he becomes so consumed in his anger because he wanted his father to drop the hammer and say, you're bad, and he's good. Now that's simple. That really oversimplifies it. But that's what he wanted the father to do. He wanted the father to scold him and say, you've been terrible, you've been rotten, you're no good to me. This is the golden child. This is the wonderful son. And he was angry. You mean they're having a celebration? He was angry. Don't be the older son. Don't be upset when God's blessing falls upon another brother and sister in Christ. Don't be upset. Hey, listen, when God makes much of restoration and God uses that person for the glory of God, keep your jealousy at bay. Understand that God is a God of restoration. It might be you one day. He was angry. Look at his attitude. Verse 28 tells us again, he said he wouldn't go in. Man, you got to come back to the house. You're not going to believe this. Let me tell you what all the noise and the music and the food. You smell that? Man, that is, that is ribeye. Medium, medium rare. That is, that is awesome. you you got to come be part of this. There's plenty of it. What's, what's it for? Your, your, your brother came back. He said, my who? You, you mean to tell me they're, they're having a party? Does dad know about this? Oh, yeah. He's the one that told us to go get it. He, you you should have saw him. Your dad was running. Your dad never runs. Your dad run out in the middle of the road, flagged traffic down, hugged his neck, stopped the camel caravan, and man come back, told us to go. Your dad, he's, he's wearing your dad's best clothes. He's wearing your dad's ring. You know that one you've been wanting that you, know, you think it's your inheritance? He's wearing that ring. Got your dad's shoes on, sitting at the head of the table. You're kidding me. The Bible said he wouldn't go in. You can call it what you want to, but in the South, we'd say he got an attitude. He's got an attitude. He's pouting. He's pouting. He's upset that somebody, that his brother and his father are restored. I wonder, I wonder how many nights that he, he watched his dad and listened to his dad weep and cry over the condition of his brother. Now again, I, I understand you're not going to read this in here. Okay, but it's hard for me to imagine a father that looked for his son every day, didn't spend some time on his face praying for him, and didn't spend some time agonizing because of the condition his son was in. As a dad, I can only imagine what that's like when your children go wayward. But maybe it hurt his dad all these nights. But see, he didn't care about that. All he cared about was himself. His attitude, he would not go in. He said, I'm not going in. I'm not celebrating. I'm not happy that he's back. You see, he loved the calf more than he did the kid. All right, then what about this? What about his arrogance? What about his arrogance? He was, this dude was arrogant. He was arrogant. You say, how do you know that? Look at verse number 29. When you read verse number 29, five times you, you hear him say either me, I, or my. Five times. I, me, or my. You know what that tells me? He thought this whole thing was all about him. It had nothing to do with him. You realize that he didn't waste his goods. He didn't waste his substance. He wasted the father's substance. This, this older son, he wasn't out anything that the father promised him. This, this guy didn't waste his substance. This guy didn't do him any harm. He didn't mess with his inheritance. He didn't mess with his position. The only person this guy hurt, he hurt his father and he hurt himself. But he wants to make it all about him. He played the victim card. He's arrogant. It's all about me. I, me, my, five times. Galatians 6, you know the restoration chapter? Over there when he talks about, you know, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, consider in thyself, lest thou also be tempted. You know what he says in verse number 3 of that same chapter? He said, for if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Everything this guy had, he had because of the Father. Everything that he had. But he acted as if he deserved it just like his younger brother did. He just stayed at the house. But it was I, me or my. He said, I have served you. I've not transgressed your will. Father, look at me. See, he was arrogant. Don't be the older brother. Don't pat yourself on the back because someone that's fallen have now been restored. You know, the Pharisee, I thank God that I'm not like other men. Man, don't, don't be that way. Don't have that mindset. Be grateful that God has restored them, understanding that it could have been me. And if God would restore him, maybe God would restore me. Obviously that he would. Here's, here's really where it, gets, where it gets really 
Harry, he accused the father of injustice. When you look at verse number 30, now here's this, here's this dad, a gracious dad, a good father. We talked about that this morning, didn't we? He more, he more or less shook his finger in the face of his dad and stood toe to toe and looked his dad in the eyes and said, you've done wrong by what you've done. Now that's, that's what he said in essence. Look at verse number 30. He said, "All the, verse number 29, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. He said, but you never gave me a kid that I might make marry with my friends. Bless your little heart. You, you never did that for me. You've never done anything for me. Even though I'm living in your house, wearing your clothes, eating your food, you've never done anything like that for me. He said, but as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy... Notice he makes a point to point out the faults of his brother. That's arrogance. He's saying, look how good I am, look how bad he is. Sometimes maybe you ought to listen to how we speak about people around the things of God. He made it a point to point out to his father, like his dad needed to be reminded. Like his dad really needed, oh, you know what, son, you're right. What was I thinking? Go get that, get that you know, rib out of his mouth. He can't finish eating. He's got to be, we got to kick him out of here. I forgot he did that. Man, that's pretty presumptuous that the father didn't know. But he had to make sure he got his little jab in, didn't he? Had to make sure he got his little slam in. Well, you know, the, the, the son, he said, but this thy son was come, verse 30, which hath devoured thy living with harlots. Thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. This is your fault, Dad. You should not have done what you've done. He accused the father. And the father knew something he did. You know the father knew of the repentance of his son. Who are we to question God when God restores an individual? This, this boy was out in the field. He didn't know. He didn't hear the conversation. But the father knew the repentance of his son. And as far as I'm concerned, it's between the father and the son. It has nothing to do with the brother. That's between him and God. A man's repentance is between... Now, there'll be evidence of that repentance. Don't misunderstand me. You go to the book of 2 Corinthians, and, I, and I'm hurrying. I really am. I understand what time it is. You go book to the book of 2 Corinthians. You remember 1 Corinthians, I believe it's chapter number 5, when they had to do church discipline on the man? He was having an affair with, you know, with, with a family member. He was having incest with a family member. And they told him, he said, listen, you've got, you got to vote him out. You've got to put him out of your membership. He's causing great damage. He's got to understand. And, you, know, you turn his body over for Satan for the, you know, for the destruction of his flesh. And, uh, but in 2 Corinthians... I believe there's a good possibility that that same man has now come back and the Apostle Paul is, is encouraging them to restore this man as if this man has shown repentance. Let me read the verse, 2 Corinthians chapter number 2, verses 6 through 8. Sufficient is to such a man as his punishment, which was inflicted of many, so that contrariwise ye ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. You know what he said? Regardless if it was this man or another man, Paul said there's a guy that's got right with God and he's looking to come back. He needs you to accept him back and to help him and to love him so that he's not overcome with much sorrow because of his condition. Listen church, we have a responsibility to understand that God can restore who God chooses to restore. And my responsibility is to treat them as restored, treat them as such because of the work that the Father's done in their life. You say, how do I do that? Well, we're going to have to give over ourselves, but listen to what 1 Peter 4, 8 says. And above all these things, have fervent charity. Now listen to this phrase, among yourselves. Have fervent charity among yourselves. Do we really love the brethren? Do we really love the brethren? Now, some people's easy to love, some people not so much. But do we really love God's people? We love them not because of who they are, but sometimes in spite of who they are. But he said, have fervent, that red hot heated love. Have fervent charity among yourself. For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. And we got to love, we got to learn to love people. Fallen people, broken people, hurting people, damaged people. But people that God's restored, we got to learn to love people and help one another. We're all broken, hurt, damaged. And would it not be for the grace of God, we'd still be out wandering lost in the world. We've got to learn to help and love one another. He admitted that his friends were different from the family, friends of his father. He said, let me make merry with my friends. Your crowd's not my crowd. Now, he really identifies with himself. So I said all that to say this, don't be the older brother. When people get right with God, when people come back to the Father, and they make things right with Him, 
They might have been in sin. They, listen, they might have drugged the name of Christ in the mud. They might have done some terrible, some terrible things. But when they really get, get right with God and God restores them, don't be the older brother. Let's help them. Let's encourage them. Let's strengthen them. Let's build upon that and allow God to help us get us to where we ought to be. And I want to close with a continuation I said about this morning. Remember we were talking about the character of the Father, or the character of our Heavenly Father. We read the verse of Psalm 145 about God is good. The Lord is good. He's just. But as you look at this passage, you're going to notice this, and you're going to be able to have a comparison. The Father had the same compassion and the same care for both of His sons. I can prove it. He treated them the same, both of His sons. He looked for them both when they were not where He wanted them to be. When, that, when, the, when the younger son was wayward, now the Bible said that he saw him from, from a great way off. You know how he saw him? He's looking for him. You can almost see the, the father sitting at the meal celebrating, man, music's playing maybe, and, and the feast is happening, dishes are clanging together. You, the, man, the, the steak's searing on the grill. He can smell that all that's going on. But it's almost like he looked at the servant and said, hey, where's my, where's my boy at? Where, where's he? He's, he's missing. He's not here. Maybe somebody come and got and say, hey, your son, he's, He's over here. He, he was looking for him when he wasn't there. Can I tell you something? When we're not where we ought to be, I can promise you this. God's looking for you. God sees you right where you're at. And so he looked for them both when they were not where he wanted them to be. He went to them both. Remember, he went out. He ran out in the street, met his son on his way out. He went to him before the son could ever get there. This son said, I'm not going in. So guess what? Father went to where he was at. He loved them the same. He spoke kindly, not harshly, to both of them. Well, I hope you'll wrap your brain around that for just a minute. Now, when God convicts you, when the Spirit of God convicts you, there's a harshness to that. There's a harshness to conviction. There's a very seriousness and a, and a somberness to conviction. Why? Because God's getting our attention let us know, you're not, well, I'm not pleased with you. But when this individual comes back and they return, notice the kindness in the Father's voice. Man, he's weeping, he's crying, he's welcome, he's giving instructions on how to treat this, this, this wandering son. But when he goes back and he talks to this other son, this other son wags his finger in his father's face and said, this is all your fault. And his father just spoke kindly to him. Can I tell you something? Even in our mishaps and our, when we misspeak, I'm grateful that the father speaks kindly to his children. The father speaks kindly to his children. So he spoke kindly, not harshly. But at the end of the day, you know what his, the father's desire was? He desired to restore both of them. You say, well, preacher, one was worse than the other. I beg to differ. Maybe so. And it might have been the one that was at the house was the one that was worse than the one that was in the world. But they were both out of where the father wanted them to be. But you know what the father's desire was? It was not that one would be in and one would be out and they just switched places. It's that both of his sons would be close to him in one household at one meal, at one celebration. Can I tell you, God is in the restoration business. How do we treat the prodigals when we come home? We need to understand what the will of the Father is. God wants to restore them. God's excited. God's celebrating the restoration. We ought to do the same. Hey, we, we ought to do our very part to celebrate with them, to be, to be excited and grateful and to help them to grow and to nurture them and to, to flourish that relationship the best we can. And then we ought to do everything we can to, protect from, to, to prevent from us becoming the older brother. Why, man, there's damage to that. And we're not going to help us, and we're not going to help them. Listen, would you do this with me tonight? Would you stand? Here's the invitation tonight. <clears throat> I didn't really preach. I didn't really preach as geared toward lost people, per se, this evening. We mentioned that this morning. But I would like to give you an opportunity. Maybe you're here this morning. The Spirit of God's still dealing with your heart. You say, preacher, I'm not saved. I'm not where I need to be. I'd like to give you an opportunity to come, get that settled. Maybe you're here and you're, as a Christian, you're a wanderer. You say, Preacher, I know that I'm not where the Father wants me to be. There are a lot of people around the altar this morning in business with God, and I praise the Lord for that. But maybe there's some that didn't do business today. Maybe there's some in here that say, You know what? I've got loved ones that I know are not where God wants them to be. And I'm burdened for them. I really am. I'm burdened for them. And I want so much for their lives to be restored. I want so much for them to be what God and where the Father wants them to be. Maybe tonight you just like to slip out from where you're at. You'd like to find yourself on an altar and just pray. Talk to the Father. It was a couple of weeks back, I guess, when I felt like the Lord was dealing with my heart about this message. And I wrote one word in my 
my notes and my phone. I just worked, wrote the word arise. Help me to remember where to come back. Listen tonight, if you're not where you ought to be with God, won't you arise and get back to the Father? I'm not telling you to arise and go to the church. Arise and go. Listen, arise and go back to where God was to have you to be. We have a, we have a, you have a great Father. If you're saved, you've got a great Father. If you're here tonight and you've never been born again, but Bruce was talking, he said that when he was seven, he knew all the ins and outs. He could tell you the information, but he had never personally trusted Christ until that day. Maybe that's you. Maybe you can quote the verses, sing the songs, tell the tale, but you've never personally, genuinely trusted Christ to be your Savior. If that's the case, why not tonight? Christian, if you're wondering, you're not where, you're not where you need to be, why don't you get it right tonight? Maybe a relationship between parents and children, brothers and sisters in Christ. Maybe need to be restored tonight. Just get it right.